presence of God, um, being, being able to talk to God in such a way that he was able to answer questions, that he's able to direct you, lead you, guide you, um, get rid of anger, um, get rid of uh, depression, doubts, disappointments, all these things. That's what he is just showing us. Sometimes in our lives today, we kind of wonder, and I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm, I'm speaking by myself too, sometimes we allow prayer to be, have one dimension. But prayer should be something that just it is, we're so engaged in that we constantly are doing it, and, and therefore we find ourselves constantly in God's presence. So in other words, if you have a good prayer life, you're going to, be, you're going to experience God's power, and sometimes you won't even have to like, stop and pray. You'll just be living a prayer for life. Does anybody understand what a prayer for life is? That you pray so much that you seem like you always got God on the phone. He's always on the line because you can hear him, and then you know he can hear you. And so this is what's being discussed in this book. Um, I, I think it's interesting, that, and Lee Bray said it as well, when, when the disciples who had followed Jesus came to, find, I believe they came to a realization that, hey, uh, we've been with Jesus, but we, we need to know what he does. And I think, and he's going to discuss this too, the reason why the disciples asked Jesus about teach us to pray was because they saw Jesus praying all the time. Do you remember how many times in the Bible they said that Jesus went apart to a mountain to pray? Or Jesus went over there and prayed? He was always praying from the beginning to the end. I mean, the last night of his earthly ministry, where was he in the Garden of Gethsemane? What was he doing? He was praying. And so the disciples early on saw that there was something about Jesus. And I believe it was even before they fully understood that he was the savior of the world. They, they, they knew he was special. They knew that having seen what happened with John the Baptist and the heavens opening and, and God saying, this is my beloved son whom I will please. Having seen that, they knew that he was special from God, but they didn't understand the fullness of his work. Yet they saw him pray. They saw his miracles. They heard him teach. But they didn't, and it's interesting, they didn't ask Jesus, they didn't say, teach us how to preach. They didn't say, teach us how to do miracles. What did they say? Teach us what? Well, no, that's not what he said. He said, teach us to pray. Look at it. Somebody look it up. He said, teach us to pray. Now, I agree. My whole life, I thought it was teach us how to pray. But that's not what they asked. They, they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. What did that mean? That they weren't looking for a, a script for prayer. They were looking for an example of prayer. They were like, Jesus, show us what you do. Show us how you do it. Show us how you are able to come into a place where you can just talk to God like you do. I can imagine that they, they would, when Jesus would be up for praying, sometimes when they were nearby, they would listen. They're like, wow, he sure is connected with God. He sure, ooh, look at this, listen to this. They could probably feel the power between God the Father and God the Son. And they just said, Lord, show us, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Teach us so that we can have the same encounter with God, with your Father, as you do. And so that's what I think is important. I'm going to let y'all read the introduction um, yourselves at your leisure. But what I do want to do is, is kind of touch on two things, and I'm going to get into this lesson, and I'm going to let y'all go today. Uh, chapter, you just read the introduction when you can, please, but please do read the introduction. He's talking about how to use this study. Again, this is not about learning uh, a, a, a script for prayer. It's about learning to engage and have your own prayer life. One thing I've learned, and I'm sure all of you have learned, everybody has a different prayer life. It's not about the time of day you pray. It's just that you pray. It's not about how you pray, like if you stand and sit and laying down. You know, sometimes you're going to, wherever the spirit moves you, but it's not like one prayer is going higher than the other one. It's about the fact that you do what? You pray. And, and so this is what this is about. And, and, and again, moving us to a place where we understand that we can pray about everything. We're ready. You pray without ceasing, but we need to know we can pray about everything, anything. We can come to God, and we'll see this in some of our examples of prayer, um, um, that we can pray and go to God and approach God on, in any situation. In depth. praying. You just said it, yeah. When you, and that moves you to what? Surrender or submission. So that's a good point. And that takes us to one of the things I'm talk, I, I want to talk about. So, Reverend, Sister Van. Have you opened up this discussion with the disciples asking Jesus how to pray? Mm -hmm. Essentially, how the prayer would take place in the temple style. Exactly. And the legitimacy, but that's what it has to pray. Right, right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's exactly right. <coughs> right. 
that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I'm going to tell you this quick story. I think I may have, may have missed this once before, but one of the things I, one of my close friends, and we were <coughs> been friends since we were in college, and <coughs> they used to tease me. Um, we've been friends since college, so they, he was fully aware that I prayed, you know, all the time, because I'll I tell you this quick story. So I did go to a couple of parties when I was in college, I will say that. But, I, but, I, but everybody would have to pray before we went to the party. And so one time, after I finished praying, one of my friends just got up and went back to his dorm room, and I said, what happened? He said, man, after the prayer, I just didn't feel like doing nothing else. I just want to kind of go to bed. So, um, but that was my ministry, <laughs> to pray. <clears throat> but, um, he had come down um, after my surgery, and, and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I've been kind of holding this for a while. And I said, well, how long have you been holding? He said, since 1986. And I said, what you got to say? I mean, he says, man, you know, I used to kind of resent or not understand how when you prayed, you act like it was just you and God talking. He said, because in his training, and he was always in the church. I mean, you just see, he just kind of felt like I was out of order by saying God or Father. You know, it was kind of like, I was jumping over some process. And I found it fascinating. And I said, so what made you come to understand that maybe that's what we all can do? He said, well, when you were sick, he said one time, he says, you were praying for everybody. And he said, I actually felt for the first time that it was okay for the Christian, he a Christian, to really come to God. He said, it wasn't about, you know, what you said in the words. It was just knowing that God was there to have a conversation with. And I was glad he got it. I'm glad. I'm sorry it took us that long to have that conversation, but I was glad he got it because I said, that there it is. When you have a relationship with God and you sur surrender, it's not about you being perfect. It's not about you being, you know, better than anybody else. It's just about your relationship. It's just like sometimes you have a relationship with a friend. Your relationship is deeper than somebody else's, even though they might be around them all the time. It's about how much, how willing you are to take everything to the Lord in prayer. What's the song say? Oh, what peace. Oh, what needless pain. Why? everything to God in prayer. If we're willing to carry everything to God in prayer, God is, is, is that way that he wants us. He's how many times we say, cast your cares upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us. It, it, and so I'm saying that to say this is the posture that we all must take. But let me preface and say this again. But we also must share this with other believers. Now, I'm talking to my friend. He's been, he been, he been a believer, you know, for, for, for at least 30 some years, but just never got past the process of prayer into the relationship part of prayer. That, that's, that, and that's the hold up with a whole lot of people. A whole lot of people get to pray, start praying, and this, it looks so big, like I can't even do this. Is this too much? How do I talk to God? And not understanding that God is not written down some particular words we say. What God wants us to do more than anything else is come to him, to approach him, to have an encounter with him. And that's something that we have to take the steps on. We have to, we have to become, well, James said, if you draw near to God, he'll. So, but we have to do what? And how do we draw near? Through our prayer. That's how we draw near. So, and, and, and the other thing I want us to understand before we get to this lesson is praying is not us moving God. We're not moving God when we pray. We're not getting, getting God to go our way. Prayer is, as we pour out, back to what Dean Sheffield said, is submit and surrender. Prayer opens the door so God can do what? Move us. Get us right where he wants us to be. So, so I want us to understand that when you go to God, sometimes if you really, I'm sure everybody has experienced that. Sometimes you go to God and you go one way and try to say something, and next thing you know, you end up over here because he was saying, no, that's not what I want you to be. But because you were surrendered, you end up right where he wants you to be. How many of us have ever prayed a prayer? You start out praying about one thing God told you that you need to be somewhere else for that prayer. And then you were way over there. It was because you came into the prayer with a surrendered heart. And, and that's what I think, and that's why, you know, sometimes y'all people say, well, I've been praying the Lord didn't do this. The Lord probably was telling them what to do, but they were too busy telling God what to do. And as a result, they couldn't hear what God was saying and, and end up not getting their prayers because the prayer they were asking was what God wanted them to do. As we pray according to God's will, what's going to happen? His will is going to be done as we pray according. So the, tr the key for us is getting where he wants us to be so that we can pray according to his will. Because one thing we know, God's will will be will be done. All right. All right. That wasn't even in the book. That was just something the Lord gave me today on the plane. Okay. Let's get, let's look at chapter one. I want to, we're going to, and we're going to do a, we're going to do this different. We're going to do this with some Q and A. So either one or two things are going to happen. Either people are going to raise their hand. I'm going to start pointing at people. So that means everybody got to be ready. Okay. Everybody got to be ready. Is everybody ready? All right. Got to be ready. Chap, chapter one, ver, ch uh, page 11. That's what we're going to start at page 11. Um, learning from Nehemiah. And um, let me see what time. 
how much time frame I got. It's 1031. So let's give us, let's say this is going to go up the next 40 minutes. We're going to work hard, okay? All right. So I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'm going to be ready to get some other people to read. So we, we know most of this, but I'm going to give background anyway. Nehemiah was an exiled Jew, and his prayers propelled him into favor with Artaxerxes, his, his, his boss, the king of Persia. And he was in a position of authority because he was a royal cupbearer. And as a result, he had proximity to um, be able to talk to the king. And as a result of his conversation with the king, the heart was moved to allow him to return to Jerusalem to rebuild. He was in a position of authority. And let me take, go outside the book for a minute and go to the scripture. The Bible says in chapter 1 of Nehemiah that, that Nehemiah, and, it, and I want to be clear, Nehemiah never lived in, never lived in Jerusalem. He was born in captivity. And, and came in favor with Artaxerxes while he was in captivity. Yet, he has such a love for God that the idea of, of Jerusalem, the place where God has settled his people and God's, where God initially been present um, um, for his people, that in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was ransacked and burned down, the walls were broken and burned down, that he, 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 he was sad about it. And so in chapter 1, two or three things we pick out, a couple of friends, a couple of guys had gone to Jerusalem, had come back, and he said, well, how's everything in Jerusalem? He said, they said, it's terrible. The walls are knocked down. The walls are burned. It's awful there. And, and it hurt him to the point where the Bible says he was sad. He just, it, really, the Bible says his legs gave out. He, in, in read chapter 1, you get a man. He, he shook, and he ended up falling down, really, because of the fact that, that he was so hurt that a place he had never been, but because he loved God so much, uh, was in disrepair. Now, here's the key about that. It wasn't just the fact that the city was in disrepair that moved Nehemiah. It was the fact that as a result of the city being in disrepair, that the people were exposed. They were ashamed or embarrassed, and they were at, at, at risk of being overtaken by other nations around them. So his real concern wasn't just the walls. It was God's people. The idea of God's people being ashamed, that bothered him, disgraced. That bothered him. The mere, the mere fact that they were um, potential victims for all the other nations around him, that hurt him. And as a result of his pain, and so let me pause here. So what we see is a man that's in pain, a man that's disappointed, a man that's so a man in sorrow. Now, anybody here ever felt pain? Anybody ever felt some sorrow, some situation where you were just disappointed? You just like, oh, I can't even believe this. It's our oh, man. And it could have been about a number of things. You, you ask questions, Chef? Or oh, you just raise your hand? Okay. And, and so... This prayer that we're about to see, the Nehemiah praise, is a prayer out of that space. Now, we're going to touch on a lot of them, but that prayer was a prayer out of a dark place. It was out of a, a deep spiritual disappointment. He was in, that's where he was. He was, he was concerned. You see, when you love God, you're going to love God's people. That's how it works. Now, if you don't love God's people, then you need to ask yourself a couple of key questions. But if you love God, you're going to love God's people. And then if you love God, you're going to love God's people, and you're going to love the purpose that God has for his people. So you can't, if you love God, you're not going to be satisfied with somebody, one of God's people that's in pain or in sorrow or going through something. You're certainly not going to be, and if, if we can talk turkey, you're not even going to be feel good if they're going the wrong direction. You know, if you love God's people, you ain't going to be able to see nobody, you know, falling off the cliff. You'd be like, hi, hi. No, you're going to care about that thing, and you're going to be praying and interceding. So I'm, I'm using all of these to say that he was in a, uh, in a, in a tough spot. His, his heart was hurt because of God's people being the condition they were in and because of God's purpose. This, this, this city that God had made for his people um, was in disrepair. Now, let's do this. Um, who got the Bible with them? They don't mind reading that. Mother B, if you would read Nehemiah chapter 1, just the first four verses, if you would. Verse 4 is where I want to focus on. He heard, the, he heard the report, and he sat down and cried. 
and he mourned. Now, right there at mourn, it could go either way. He could mourn and go into disappointment. He could mourn and get mad and want to go down and start some stuff down in Jerusalem. Or he could mourn and do what? And fast and, and go to God. He chose that option. He didn't choose the option of being, um, um, he was disappointed, but he didn't choose the option of being sorrowful on the inside, depressed. So that's just, that's how you can, sometimes we take what we feel and put it and press it down, and that's where depression comes from. And sometimes we turn it out, and that's where anger comes from. But he took it up. I didn't write that down. Somebody write it down. He didn't turn it in. Depression. He didn't turn it out. That's anger, hostility. But he took it up. He took it up, the Bible says, and he fasted and prayed. Now, let's talk about those two elements. So we're going to be doing some fasting this spring. I may as well go ahead and tell you out the gate. Fasting meant that this situation was so significant that he realized that he needed to lay aside certain things that would potentially hinder him from having the encounter with God that he wanted. That, that's what it was. This, this fasting for him it, it, it was not just um, an act of, 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 of physical. It was a spiritual action that he laid aside. He said, I really need to talk to God. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I know that I need a clear signal. And I need some stuff that's in my life. And, it, and, and it, it, it's, you know, sometimes it's bad. So sometimes it's just something that you come become accustomed to. That you say, I'm going to move that to the side. And during that time, I'm going to focus on God. And it's kind of a meditative thing. Fasting and praying have to go together. You can't really, if you if you praying and fasting, I'm going to say if you're fasting, the purpose of that fast is to, is to pray. If you're not praying when you fast, you're just on a diet. Right. What you're supposed to be doing. And the purpose of what you're doing it for. That's exactly right. So he turned up. And he and he more he did more on certain days, but af, as a, after his morning, he fasted and he prayed before the God of heaven. He went to God after he had fasted, after he had got rid of anything that would have hindered him or slowed him down, or anything that would have made him sluggish, anything that would have made him um, um, anything that would have hindered his capacity to go to God the way he wanted to go. He began to pray. Anybody ever fasted in here? Anybody ever really took a fast? I, you, somebody give me a couple of facts about when you fasted, how did it affect your prayer life? Just whoever want to talk. Jerry Brown. Say it one more time, sorry. Stronger from the inside, okay. Okay, that's good. One. Reverend Edwards. Okay. Mm hmm. Okay. So strength, clarity, your, your, your faith increasing, okay, as a result of the fast. Okay, Dean Thomas? You felt closer, okay. In tune with God, I got you, okay. So, so your alignment came as you put some other stuff out of the way. All right, anybody else want to? Okay, well, that's a good one, Dean Thomas. That's a good one. So one of the things, so you know everybody heard of ADHD, right? And people have attention deficit. Now, that's, they talk about, you know, a diagnosis from the DSM-5 book that somebody was assigned to you. But here's the truth. Many Christians got spiritual ADD. It's hard for us to focus, in, you know, because we just, I mean, this is, I, how many of us sat down and started praying? And I'm not talking about every day, but sometimes you meant to pray and you didn't get a chance to pray or you were trying to pray and then something else came up, phone rang, you know, just or something. And then next thing you know, you, did, you missed that prayer. And then you're going to double up on the next prayer. And then the day is well, well spent. And you never really got to it. Fasting helps you 
with your spiritual ADD. Why? Because when you are not eating or not whatever you're fast, fasting from and you remember, why well, you ain't nothing, it reminds you why you didn't eat nothing and it causes you to go back to what you were doing. To what you were doing. That's the, the prayer part. That's the, that's the, the alignment. That's the, where the spiritual strength from the clarity because you're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving that alone so what I, need, I need to pray because really if you're fasting, sometimes when you get hungry, you're supposed to do what? Supposed to pray. When you're supposed to pray. Whatever it is that you're fasting from, when you think about that, your next move is to do what? Pray. That's your next move. And so it helps us um, get rid of that the stuff. Um, I um let's see what I want to tell y'all the story here. Okay, yeah. Um, Deacon Downey actually put this best. And I've said it before and I say it again. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would think that I was hungry. Because I was like Pavlov's dog. If I woke up in the middle of the night, I had to go make biscuits from scratch. Now think about how long that took to make scratch biscuits. Well, maybe I shouldn't say scratch. If you make them a biscuit, what does that count? Does that count? Kind of. All right, somebody just said no, it didn't count. Okay. But you know, I, I did get the milk and I did get the egg and made my little biscuits. And, and I would make five biscuits every time, you drop biscuits and drop, butter them up, eat some jelly. So, of course, two things happened. I gained a lot of weight. But the second thing was I should have been praying. I thought I was hungry. But digging down, how, how, many, how many remember what he said? He said sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night, it, you, 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 God was telling you to pray, but you responded to the physical. It just went right to the kitchen. And I'm saying that to say that, 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 that when we fast, that gets rid of, that, that, that opens up a block of time right there where we can fixate and focus on God. That's what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah uh, laid aside stuff, and he prayed before the God of heaven. And I, I, as I look at this, you know, I know that Nehemiah was the, the author of this. Somebody else may have written the words. But when he, when he uses this term and prayed before the God of heaven, I think that's significant because it, it, he didn't just say, I prayed. He didn't just say, I prayed before God. He's, it, I, it's almost like his fasting opened a door for him to see really truly the greatness of God. In other words, he was in, he was stuck in a situation here in this world, a situation of disappointment because of Jerusalem. He was stuck in a situation of, 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 of sadness because God's people were being disgraced. But when he fasted, all of a sudden he realized that who he worked for wasn't in charge. He was fasting to who? He was talking to the boss, the head man, who? God in heaven. He said, I, I prayed before the God of heaven. I think among, uh, along with clarity and strength and faith and being open and aligned to the tomb and, and, and get concentration back, what fasting does in conjunction with us is begin to open a door so that we can see truly as best we can the fullness of God and his power. Because if you live in this world long enough, you will think the world got the upper hand. If you, if you just let the world talk to you all the time, you will think that, it's, that, that, that the world is the dictate of what happens. But when you begin to understand the greatness of God, and sometimes, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about mature Christians now, if you're not, if you watch the news every day, you can think, boy, it's out of control. But one thing we know, that the world is not out of control, because who's in control? God is in control. I want to say this right here. I promise I'm going to get to the lesson. Because I, so, in the beginning, before God ever spoke, where everything moved. It was chaos. Somebody say chaos. chaos. That means stars, stars were shooting and darkness was everywhere. It's, it, it, it was just, everything was just happening randomly. Everything was just happening. If, if somebody had been on point watching, they could probably describe it as everything seemed out of control. That's what somebody probably said. But then when God spoke, chaos became cosmos. It became order. That the sun, when God spoke, suddenly began to move on an axis. I don't know what the sun, sun might just be moving around on its own then. God spoke and the sun moved on its axis. Then God spoke and the, and the moon moved on in a certain ellipses. And then, and then there was day and night. Why? Because the earth began to spin with a level of control. Who controlled it? God controlled it. So everything came into order. And so what we know from that concept, and then if we go over to Hebrews chapter 1, God holds the world together. He controls the world by the what? P power of his power of his words. Amen. Hebrews 1 said the power of his word. In other words, same way God said, let there be light, he speaks now and whatever happens, happens. He speaks it. And when he speaks it, it's over once he said it. Once he said it, it's over, it's over. It's hurricane come when God said hurricane. The, 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 the meteorologist might tell you, well, it's no longer over water. Well, how did it get off the water then? God spoke and said, go on over land and, and, and let, it, let it be over. 
that's how that God controls everything. So I'm saying that when we understand that the God we serve has power over everything, when we go to him, we understand that we're not just going to somebody who got control over our life. We're going to him who has control over everything. If you're at your job and, and you talk to your supervisor, your supervisor say, I don't know. What's your next move? They go to the person over there. Next level, the person, well, I'm not sure. Then he's okay, let me talk to the next person up. Well, for the Christian, they ain't but one level. And that's the one who's in charge. And I want you to think about that now. We don't have to go through. See, here's the truth. None of y'all, when y'all want to pray, got to come call me. I mean, we can pray together. But I'm saying you don't have to come because you have direct access to through, through Jesus Christ. And so our prayers, and I want us to understand, we talk to God, we're talking to him who is able, who has all power and authority. Now, that's what Nehemiah recognized in chapter 1, verse 4, that he was talking to the God of heaven. He was in his presence because he said, pray before. He knew that he wasn't just talking. He was in the presence of God, and I think the fasting facilitated him feeling the way that he felt and, and acknowledging God in the way that he did. All right, now we're going to move just a little bit further. Now, let's ask some questions here. I've kind of mentioned it, but let's just, let's just do it as a lesson. How would somebody describe, if you could just use one word to describe Nehemiah's mental state in verses 1 through 3 when he initially heard about Jerusalem? What was his mental state? Somebody just cross out some words. Distraught. Devastation. Shocked. Sorrowful. What's that? Depression. All these things. Shock. All these things. That's what he felt. All at once. He was, he was angry. He was awash in emotions. None of them good. I mean, think about that. It was like wave after wave. So it was anger and sorrow and depression and distraught. All that hit him back to back to back. He was in a hurricane of emotions. Now, that being the case, and I'm going to be going back over it again, but it's a purpose to this. What did he do then? prior to making his, his, his request to God. Before he told God about the problem, before he asked God, what did he do to get ready? He got ready by fasting. He got ready. I want y'all to hear that. He got ready. That was preparation. He just, he, he, and again, sometimes you're gonna not, you, you ain't going to have time to get ready. Sometimes you pray. But this is why it's important to have a prayer life. Prayer life means you make some time to do what? To talk to God. You make time. When I, when I first thought uh, pastor, I mean preaching, Reverend Chris gave me this book called um, My Utmost for His Highest. Has anybody read that? Oswald, is that? Oswald Chambers, his name? Yeah, and it kind of, um, it, was, it was a book of, about praying. And another book he gave me, Could, could You Not Tear One Hour? You re- we said that too? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. And so that, that book was about, about prayer, about, you know, making time to pray. Y'all remember when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and the disciples, what did they do? They had, that, they, they had that problem we all faced. They, they had a little ADHD, a little spiritual ADHD. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they had to know something was happening. Why? Because they had just left the upper room. Jesus had just said, I'm about to leave you. Jesus had just called out Judas. He had just rebuked Peter. They knew something was happening. They were in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, y'all tell me one hour. And every time Jesus came back, they were what? They were sleeping. Every time, every, every time he came back. My, my, my point in saying that is that, that, that the necessity of prayer, both of those books re- recommended, suggested, promoted that we make time in our lives to pray. When you make time in your life to pray, when you make it, when you put it on your schedule, and I'm saying this to me too, when you write down your daily report or what you got to do, a calendar invite, send yourself one to say pray. Everybody might not know a calendar invite. I just learned that myself recently. But, you know, that means that you put it on your schedule. My prayer time is. Whatever time, whatever time you put my prayer time is, if it's 9 to 9, 15 in the morning, or so whatever time it is, put that down. Schedule yourself some time to pray and, 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 and prepare. And it may be that you pray after you, I mean, before you eat. That you might pray. And this is what I've begun doing. Pray before I turn the TV on, start watching TV. Because once I get the TV on, then I'm all trying to figure out what's on the TV. That let be what, what we do. All right, so this is what we, so I, I'm pulling that part out. He, he did his, his, his preparations, it was fasting. And, and that's what we do as well. But also his preparation was um, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Dozier. Thank you, that brother Moore. Deacon Moore. Deacon, now, Deacon Moore is pointing at you because I didn't see you over there. You had your hand low. Okay. That's a good, that's a good, that's, that's, that's your preparation to get the right to get. So you bring paper and a pen, pen and paper, pen and, paper. and write. And, and so that's, that's a good example. That's a good example of preparation and prayer. So when, and, and, and I'm just reaching out here. So when you write down, when you bring your pen and paper, that means you're expecting to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about that? Well, somebody should jot that down. I'm jotting that down. That's a good. That's a good preparation. Pre pre prayer preparation. Thank you, Sister Dozer, for sharing that. That's a good one. Reverend Ellis. It's a prayer part. Okay. That's a good point. Right. No. That's right. No. So that you can what? So that you can feel and see God. Yeah, and hear him, and hear him. That's it. That's what we're looking for, right? That's right. That's right. So the, the meditation, Reverend Elvis, thank you, is, is key to being able to hear. Because when you're praying, you should be looking for an answer. But it's going to be on time. That's right. And we're going to go back to meditation. Is that Reverend Lear? He's going to answer. I like that. He's going to answer. Everybody say that. He's going to answer. Okay, now we got some expectations. He's going to answer. He's going to answer. And so we just had to be ready um, to receive his answer. And as Reverend Les and Reverend Evans and Sister Doe said, you be ready to jot down what the, Lord, what the answer was. Because the, the human mind, A, is, is, is frail and finite. But the second thing is, remember who else fighting against you. The enemy wants to make you forget. He wants to get you sidetracked. There have been so many times I know personally that I was, the Lord said something, and before I get up, I had something else had come up. I had to take a call. And so I've come to learn that the enemy is fighting against us hearing the direct message from God. It's almost like static. If you got a, 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 a you remember CBs? Anybody remember CBs? There, there was somebody be clicking it, and you couldn't hear what they were saying. Satan's job to click, so we can't hear what God is telling us. That's a good point. Those are good, good, good prayer points right there. Good prayer points. Yes, sir. Be ready. Be ready. Mm -hmm. he's, he's right. He's, he's waiting to, 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 to distract. Let's, let's look at Nehemiah's prayer. It, be, it begins in verse 5. 
and it goes to really verse 11. So let's do this. Let's break it into bite sized morsels. Like a little tiny. But, uh, let me see. Who wants to read verse, verse 5 for me? Re Mother Kali. Mother Kali, I'm sorry. It's Revelation. You do verse 6. So look how he started. I beseech thee. What is beseeching? That's begging. Yeah, and, and it's not the way, see, the, sometimes we get that word begging wrong. It's not pitiful. You know, it's a big kind of, a, it's, huh, it's a humility, and, but it's also a humility with the expectation of who you're talking to can give you what it is you're looking for. So it's humble, though. It's humble. It's not, he didn't say, um, Lord, I'm telling you. That's not what he said. He said, I'm telling you, Lord God of heaven. He says, I'm, 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 I beseech you, I beg you, I'm, I'm on my knees coming to you, O Lord God of heaven. He says again, O Lord God of heaven. How about this, O great and terrible, the great and terrible God? Somebody help me, help me with that one. The great and terrible God. What is he saying about God? Awesome. He's saying awesome. He's saying awesome. That, that God, you're awesome. Because sometimes we see terrible again, we get thrown off. Because it's like somebody says, oh, that's terrible. Uh-huh. <laughs> but you came to learn. It was just, Lord God, you're awesome. You're awesome. And again, that's the posture. Because, see, this is worship. Oh, Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, the awesome God. That's worship. Let me tell you about worship. And, and, and so you don't think that worship is just on Sunday morning, first of all. And worship ain't always accompanied by music. Worship is from here. From the heart directed to God. But let me tell you what worship does. How many have ever looked at something? Let's, let's say you looked at you were, you were at a mountain. You might have been a stone mountain. You looked you looked at you looked out the mountain. You could see all of Atlanta. But how many of them got those that little thing they got up there where you could put some money in there and it's like a telescope type thing and you could see things what clear. You could see like it was close up. See, worship does that in our spirits as it relates to God. The more we worship God, the, the, the more we, we're drawing closer to Him. And we can see and become to know him better. That every time you say, God, you're mine. Like, that's why I can't, I can never stop myself. I know y'all probably, Pastor, I was always saying, God, I'm this. But I love the fact that he knows everything. We love the fact that he has all power. So every time we say it, every time I say it, I feel close to God because I, I, I remind myself that I'm not talking to a limited God. I'm talking to an unlimited God. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. I was talking to somebody one time who had looked at the Hubble telescope. And I think I've shared this with y'all. And they, they looked at the moon. And we can see the moon, but with the Hubble telescope, you can see craters. You can see every little contour of the moon that the Hubble telescope would allow, and it's much better than the natural eye. So what I'm saying is worship moves us out of looking through this lens. It brings us to a spiritual lens where we can see more and know more and understand more about God. So this is why he started off with worship, because that prepped him. That prepped him to understand who he was talking to. I can imagine when he started out the prayer, he was he was... He was sad, but as he began to worship God, you're awesome, he realized that the problem shrunk. Can you see that? The problem shrunk. When you realize, you know what? I'm talking to God. I ain't, I'm not talking to Joe Smith. I'm talking to God. And this problem is not too big for him. I don't even know why I'm worried about it. That's, how many of us ever start worshiping God and, and what you're worried about began to shrink down to little or nothing? So, Reverend Ellis, I'm sorry. I think I was shouting Okay. <laughs> Right, right. Right, right. Right. Because when you worship God, you out of yourself. Right. If you haven't done that, just keep worship God. Worship it, and, and, and it'll move you out of you. So, what the limitations that we have in this body, the limitations we have, quite frankly, in our minds are blown away when we engage in worship. See, Sunday worship is a practice. I, I, it's just how to it, you learn how to worship, but you, you take that home and worship every day. There's no, 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 it's not like you can over-worship God. You can't overdo it. And when you, but like as Reverend would say, when you do it, it moves you out of your own space into his presence. 
And we talked about that. We could do a whole series on living in his presence. Because in the presence of God is everything we need. And so worship gets us well in into his presence. And so now, Nehemiah, I can feel him now. Nehemiah is worshiping God in this, in his right off the rip. And that changed probably how he continued in that prayer. Because in verse 6, Revelation, what does he say? go. Day and night. See, that's what happens when you worship. All of a sudden, everything becomes clear. Y'all feel them getting clear. So let's, let's go back to this because that's connecting them. Oh, God, you are, you are awesome. And, and, and then it's like he said, and, and recognize God, you also, I also recognize this, God, you keep covenant. You keep your promises. You made the covenant. You maintain the covenant. And then, God, you have mercy. You have love and kindness for anybody that loves you and does what you say do. So now he's, 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 he's gone closer to God, but in doing so, it is giving him, giving him the posture now to really talk to God. What does he say? Lord, I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm here. Now, hear my prayer. Hear my prayer. And, and it, I, when I was younger, I used to think that was just presumptuous. But now I've come to understand that we can ask God, God, please hear my prayer. That's not offensive to God. Lord, hear my prayer. Be attentive. And, and, and look and see what I'm saying. Uh, and that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. You see, where, can, you, can you imagine him kneeling down like in a physical sense, by the spirit, I'm your servant. He remind, God, I'm your servant. Now, I might work. I get a check over here from all the Xerxes, but I'm your servant. Deacon Sheffield, you work and get a check from, but who's serving you? You's God's servant. You see, that, that posture of servant is, is way deeper than working. Because, see, you know, I heard somebody say, the church, you got volunteer in the church. If you're a child of God, there's no, you ain't volunteering. You're doing what? You, somebody, that, didn't enough people say that. I got to say it again. When you're a child of God, you're not volunteering. You are what? The same way a, a, a mother or father can say, I'm babysitting my kids. You ain't babysitting your kids. What you doing? You, 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 doing, you doing right. You doing what you should be doing. I remember one of my friends was like, I got to babysit my son. And I said, that's what happens when you have kids when you're 50 years old. You think you're babysitting your child. The same thing is true about us. We, we're not volunteering. We're serving God. That makes us his what? His servants. His servants. His children. We're, we're his servants and his children. So he said, I'm your servant your child, Lord. Now he says, verse 6. I'm praying before them. I'm in your presence now. Now, going back to what Ms. Doja said, he had been praying up in tears. This wasn't one day of prayer. How do we know that? Because this verse says, I've been praying before the when? Day and night. So he had, been, he had been warming up with this fasting and praying. So I imagine it was a lot of prayers that led up to the one that was recorded. It was a lot of praying that was led to the, the one that was here recorded in this book. I've been praying before you now, Lord, day and night. And I'm interceding, as Reverend Emerson said that. For who, I'm praying, oh Lord God, awesome God of heaven. I'm praying not for me, but I'm praying for the children of Israel, your servants. Now, this next part is this: it's heavy. It's heavy because everybody don't want to get there where he where he got in this. I'm sorry, Brother Brown. He includes himself. He didn't say them. That's right. That's that's. I'm a part of them. I, exactly. See, then that's that's that comes now. That don't just happen. Because if you you know if you just going through the motion prayer, you ain't gonna include yourself. Lord, I don't know why they doing what they doing. What's wrong with them? But when they, they tripping, Lord, I don't know what's wrong with these folk. And I. Look like to me, my daddy was sure. That was just like he could have just said my daddy, but he said us. My father's house in. He said, "But well, mine is it's in the same position as well." That's what he's saying. He he, he is he's confessing. Oh, what does confession really mean? What he already know. I like and I want somebody to tell somebody else that. Confessing is not giving God some information he didn't already have. He saw it, 
And because he saw it, you simply said, Lord, I agree with what you saw. I ain't even trying to say hey, it ain't what you saw. You saw it, I agree, I did it. I, when I was a little boy my, with my friends, his brother, we were in high school. I think we were in ninth, 10th grade, and his brother was in fifth grade. So we would come home for the football game, and we'd change clothes over his house, and then we'd go over to Blimpins over here on Old National. And I remember one time we were over there, you know, I was waiting on him to get dressed, and, and I saw his little brother go through there with his little pajamas on, and he had took some cookies and had sneaked them back to his room. So his mama, um, I don't know how square mothers know stuff. His mother didn't even leave the room. She said, boy, take them cookies back in there. And he said, I ain't got no cookies. And she got up, and he had put him in his little pajama pocket, you know, like he, like he was getting away with something. And she said, what now? Okay, mama, I got the cookies. And it was, but again, he was confessing what mama. Already and when we confess, we simply saying, God, you knew it. I just, I'm just coming because I'm tired of the lying. God, I'm telling the truth. I'm confessing. And I'm the sins of the children. God, I'm confessing the sins of the children of Israel, including my own, because we have done what? Sinned against you. Mm -hmm. It clears your spirit. Your spirit should be vexed, convicted, conflicted as a result of having unaccounted for sin unaccounted for sin. So think about think about sin uh, as you would like, um, you know, like it's a spreadsheet. When you sin, it's, it's on the spreadsheet. And the only way it's going to get clean from the spreadsheet or re reconciled is by confession. And there's only one person that can clean our spreadsheet and get it back right is who? So we confess to and I know we know this, but I'm, I want us to go through this so we can help somebody else with this right here. It, 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 can, it, it, oh, it cleanses our spreadsheet so that we are back where we need to be in a, in with the ability to have fellowship because sin breaks what? Fellowship. <laughs> the beauty about God is that he, we, we, he, hold, he maintains relationship, but we have the, the fellowship. And so if we break, if we leave and just wallow in sins, our fellowship is broken. It's so simple. Keep short accounts. Don't get in debt. <laughs> Don't get in debt because of sin. I like that right there. And, and keep short accounts, right. You don't want no big invoice out there for God. That's what you don't want there. That's a good one. Keep short accounts. That's right. So that means we need to confess when? All the time. <laughs> That's what it means. All the time. All the time. People would have you think, and see this is, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the Catholics, but they, they go to confession once a week and tell somebody something, and then they feel they're good. We can call, confess all the time because we ain't got to go nowhere to confess because we are in the presence of God as we pray and seek him. We don't have a middleman. There's no middleman. I remember one time thinking, the Catholic priest, that's a heck of a job. You got to sit down and listen to everybody else saying you got to deal with your own. That's a, whole, that's a heavy burden right there. And, and the good news is that when Jesus, I, I heard this song, I think it was yesterday. I've heard it before. No one knows how much it costs to see our sins upon the cross. Because Jesus died for our sins and shed his precious blood. That was the price. And all we're left to do is do what? Confess so that we can be what? Forgiven. But we got to do what? We got to confess. Lord, we have sinned against thee. Me and my father's house have sinned. Um, Brother Brown, read um, uh, verse 7 if you would. Mm-hmm. So he moves now into the specificity of the sin. In verse 6, he acknowledges and confesses sins. But verse 7, and this is oftentimes hard to do. Sometimes we want to, the Lord confess our sin against you. But really, you know, I ain't saying you ain't got to do this in front of everybody, but you need to do it for God. Because he said he's where? Before God. Lord, here's what I've done. Here's what we have done. Lord, we have dealt very corruptly. God, as good as you've been to us, our response was corruption. What does that mean? God, as good as you've been, we have deliberately not done what you've asked us to do. We have dealt very corruptly. Uh, what, what didn't we do? We did not keep the judgment, I'm sorry, the commandments, the statutes, no judgments. In other words, everything that God had given for his people to do, the people that decided to do what? What they wanted to do. God, I see what you're saying, and I ain't doing none of it. 
That's how he dealt corruptly. And he said, and, this, what, and he said, the, work, the exact thing, God, that you told Moses to tell us, you said it. We chose not to do it. And, and I can almost see him saying, this is why we're here today. This, is why we, this was why we're here today, right? The problem we in, and the truth is, sometimes in our, in our spiritual Christian, our Christian lives, well, I'm not stopping stop saying that. In our lives, because if we're a Christian, your life is Christian all day long. In our lives, because we have done all that we want to do and done it our way, we find ourselves in situations. How many can, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to raise my hand. If you find yourself in situations because you, you did it your way. And we do it your way. That's somebody saying that, son. Who said that? that for that Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. And what we've learned is, Christian, when you do it your way, you, you're going to be in your own way. Verse 8, he, he moves a little deep. What, what, what time is it? I'm, I'm simply, give me, somebody give me a signal or something when I get 11.23. Give me, 10, give me 12 minutes. Um, verse 8. And, and the only reason he can do verse 8 is because he has knowledge about what he mentioned in verse 7. In other words, if he didn't know God's word, verse 8, wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to do it because he would be, wouldn't know what he's talking about. Right. He's standing on the word. The principles, the foundation, he's standing on. Again, why it's important to know scripture. And, and, and somebody says, I don't know enough. Whatever you know, you stand on that. And as you get to know more, your foundation becomes what? It becomes stronger. It becomes stronger. So obviously, um, even while he was in, again, I remember, um, Nehemiah wasn't coming back home. He was actually going home. He was in, in captivity. But he kept what? He kept the, he, he, whatever word he had, he, he knew it. And we notice in his prayer, verse, so, uh, Reverend Evans, read verse 8 for me. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and read verse 9 too. They go together. Now, as heavy as verse 6 and 7 were, verse 8 and 9 is just as just as heavy because he's ostensibly saying, now, God, um, remember what you said. Remember what you said. Now, Lord, you did say if we transgress, you will scatter us among the nations. That's why they were in Babylon because they had done what? They had transgressed and God did what? He scattered them. But he said, now, remember the other part of the promise, Lord, because you also said this. If your people turn unto you and do what you tell us to do, and really do it, then even though we were cast out to the other most parts of the earth, God, you said you would gather us back, or them back from wherever they were, and bring them back to the place that God said you, that you chose to set us. I've I, I read that in two different, let me, let me do it another way. God, you said if your people turn back to you and keep your commandments, like know them, and then do them. And even though, Lord, you said if we, when we, because you said you cast us out, when you, we come back to you and keep your commandments and do them, you said you would bring us back and set us right back where we were in the beginning. In this case, it's Jerusalem. God, God, you said that we, we, I know why we're here, because we transgress. And we, I've confessed the sin, Lord, but I want to remind you that you said you'd bring us back. Think more. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, who said that? Need more. Solomon. No, I'm, I'm messing with you. You're right. I was going to say, let's, let's verify what Deacon Moore said. Somebody turn Second Second Chronicles, chapter 6. Now, somebody read. I want to read. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. We, we verify. We confirm it. So now we can tell somebody. Oh, okay. Let's do 6 and 7 then. Okay. Because they both, they both do the same thing. Let's do that. That's a good point. This is Bible study class right here. 
Second Chronicles. Somebody go to Second Chronicles six first, and I'm gonna go to seven. Second Chronicles six. Who who got? Who said I got it? Huh? Yeah. You in six? Yeah. Let's go ahead and look at um. Start at verse ten for me if you want. If you if you got time, and go to fourteen. Well, no, we'll stop there. You, you, you did 14. Do, do 14. Right. Go ahead. Read the last part of 14. Okay, so covenant. That's the key on this one. Covenant. We, Nehemiah just said covenant. He's saying covenant. In other words, again, he acknowledges that God is a covenant keeping God. Now let's go to the verse that we want to we want to hang our hats on right here. I'm going to I'm in, I'm in Second Chronicles seven now. Second Chronicles seven, and I'm going to read verse twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I've heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. He said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. I, I read the other one, Deacon Moore, because there again, in, in Solomon's prayer, there was a foundation of the knowledge of what God had already said. So nobody's introducing a new concept to God. They're simply standing on what God has already said. And so Nehemiah does the same thing in, in this record. He is simply standing on what God said. God, you said. So God told Solomon, if my people is called by my name, shall humble themselves and, 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 and seek me and turn, seek them my face and turn their wicked ways, this is what I'll do. And so basically, um, Nehemiah is standing on that. He's saying, okay, now God, this is what you said you do. Now here we are. Uh, we need you to do that because I, I agree that the people have in fact turned back. I've been back in Nehemiah chapter 1 now. I agree, Lord, that the people have turned from you. I've confessed. And now when I'm asking you, Lord, to do what you said you're going to do because we turn back to you, I'm asking that you would gather us from all the places that we've been scattered from all through Babylon and, 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 and bring us back together. That's what, he, that's what he's asking God to do. You said that you would gather them from thence and bring them into the place that I've chosen to set my name. You said when you put us out of Jerusalem because of disobedience, when we turn back to you, you do what? Bring us back. Bring us back. And, and for us today as Christians, the, the concept is true. We're not in Jerusalem, but in our, in our hearts when we walk away from God, when we turn back to God, God is going to do what? He's going to come back and bring us back into a relationship or fellowship with him. And so when, that's why lately we've been talking a lot about restoration. There are a whole lot of folk that are out there. Truth is, a whole lot of folk might be in the church actually themselves that have walked away from God and need restoration. I'm not asking everybody to come down now, but I am asking everybody to understand this concept. When you know you walked away from God, what do you need to do? Come back to God so that you can be what? Restored. What, what Nehemiah is talking about here in verse 9 is about restoration, restoring 
his God's people back the way he put them. Jerusalem was that place as the temple had been dedicated in 2 Chronicles and we hear the prayer in chapter 6 and chapter 7. The temple had been dedicated because it was where God said he'd be. And so now he's saying that to, to Nehemiah, Nehemiah said, bring us back to that place where we're right with you. God is still a restorer of relationships. And how do we get a restored relationship with God? By doing what? Coming back to him. And so my prayer has been, and will be going forward, that God brings some people that, that had a relationship with him that walked off to bring them back to him with the understanding that they were at fault, that they had sinned, that they had walked away from God. But the beauty is that God is saying, if you walk away, I'm going to punish you. But when you come back, I'm going to bring you back into myself, which is the blessing. Uh-huh. Right, right. 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 Right, right. That's right. The, I like that. So the restoration process is not just that individual, but who has to be a part of the restoration process? All of us have to be a part of the restoration process. So picture, picture a, a, a picture of a, a believer that we know that's walked out and they're coming back and they 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 coming back to the restoration. Think about taking your car to a shop and your car has been ignored for a period of time. It's just been sitting on your yard and it's you know got rain and stuff and it's a little dull in color and you know your engine ain't working right because it's just been not turning over for a while. What happens to your tires if you don't drive your car? They are dry rot. And so it costs still work, but it needs to be what? Restored. And so, you know, somebody got to get the tires and, and take them tires off and help put some new tires on, the pumps are adding them tires. Somebody got changed on, somebody got put spark plugs on there. Look at that. Look at somebody come back to Christ for us in the same way. What's your work to help them as a project? You know, maybe it'd be you to t tell them about this class. You know what? I, I've, been out of, I've been so disconnected for the Lord, I don't know how to talk to the Lord. Then that's your part. If somebody says, you know, I keep struggling with so-and-so. Somebody comes and say, well, I struggle too, but here's what the Lord did in my life. You know, every, all of us, and I want us to see that, what Deacon Lyon just said. When somebody comes back, instead of us pointing out what's wrong, let's see what we can do to be a part of the restoration project. Does that make sense to everybody? Let, let, us, let, us, let, let us be prayerful because here's what I've said this for. Two groups of people God is sending. God is sending brand new believers to St. Peter, but he's sending a whole lot of folk that we done seen before. And we need to be ready to do our part with the new believer, sharing what we learned today. And then we need to do the same thing with the, 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 the believer that's coming back to do what? To share with them what we're learning. So they'll be able to be fully restored. You're right, that rest restoration, you submit for restoration. But it's a project and a process that takes place. And God has placed us here to be a part of that process. Who, Reverend, you had your hand up. I'm sorry about that. Mm-hmm. Right, written right there. Okay, all right, I'm closing here. How many got a car, a new car that's under warranty right now? Okay, y'all do. Yeah, I, 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 I know y'all do, so let's, let me use y'all. Your car under warranty? Okay. So I'm finna go somewhere. I'm just not picking on people's cars. When you got a new car that's under warranty, when it messes up, where do you take it to? Take it to the dealership, don't you? Why do you take it to the dealership? Can't nobody else fix it. Can't nobody else fix it. You could try to get Joe down the street to do it, but Joe, I, I don't, my car not under warranty, but the, let me tell you the story. I'm going to let y'all go now. Y'all going to hold me out there. <laughs> the car, the, 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 the Bronco, lights came on, so I said, I better take it to the dealership. Because, you know, back in the day, I would take it to the dealership, then that's why the car, some of the cars y'all saw, they ain't here no more because I didn't take it to the dealership, so they broke down. <laughs> But I've gotten older, and I said, take it back to the dealership. So the guy ran a scan. And he said, oh, this all need to be done right here. And, um, and he pointed at it, and I said, well, should I get it done here? 
or should I take it somewhere else? And he looked at me like I had asked him a crazy question. He said, why would you take it somewhere else? I said, good point. And so let him fix it. Everything's good, back to normal. In Christ, when you have been saved, you're under warranty. And you can't go nowhere else but back to the Lord to get what God is trying to do. And, 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 and it's just like if you take it back to the forward place, the people that's, they're going to be forward certified. And if, if it's St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, we Christ certified to, to help somebody in their process. I'm going to stop there. But I thank God. I, I, we didn't get as far as we meant to go. And y'all, it's most of y'all fault, but um, <laughs> I thank God for what we covered. And, and what I want more than anything else is that there's a level of excitement with the men's, women, men's ministry and the women's ministry in regard to this, this, this study of approaching God. That's what I want. That's what we should want. I want, last year, how many women was average in the women's class? Okay. So every woman in the women's class who participated last year, I'm assigning you, I'm beseeching you, to get one other woman to be your partner. That means they're your accountability partner. Y'all heard of that before, right? That means you're going to remind them on, on Friday night, hey, remember we got class tomorrow. Okay, got really quiet. I'm going to try this one more time. <laughs> I'm assigned. I'm going to get to the men next. So the men are going to be a little tougher. But women, I'm asking each one of y'all to find somebody in the church or at least a good friend. But don't not check on somebody in church. Find somebody who you, you're going to call them and say, hey, we got women's ministry tomorrow. And I want you to be on there with me. And then if they, you know, you might want to give them a 10-minute call and, hey, we're going to start at 10 o'clock. And if they're not on at 10 o'clock, then you text them and say, well, I'm waiting on you. That's accountability. Men, same thing, but more. I want every man, man in here to find a man in the church, and, and, or, or if you can't, and I'm, because in just case somebody jumps on all of them, find a man that you know, that you know that would benefit from this study about approaching God. And, 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 and encourage them and, 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 and call them and text them and say, hey, and, and get the link. If you they don't, this is the favorite thing that men do. I don't have a link. I don't, have, I don't know what time it is. Because we're going to be meeting in person. Y'all meeting in person? Women meeting in person. So everybody going to be meeting in person. But be, encourage somebody to join you. It's no reason why we don't have 50 to 75 folk. How many? If y'all have 15, we probably have 15 and 30. It's no reason we don't have 75 people going through this spring studying, approaching God. There's no reason. There's too many people that St. Peter, there's too many people we know that not share. And I'm not a numbers-driven person, but I do know that there's so much potential for so many people that are in Christ to grow and so many, much potential for people who have walked away to be restored. And I, if, if we don't, that's the first step we got to have. We got to take it personal. We got to be personally responsible in, in helping somebody become strong in the Lord by walking them in with, with their hand. That's what, that's what our job has to be. If you could, Don't say you don't have time. I don't know nobody. You know somebody. And I'm doing the same thing. So I'm not assigning y'all and I ain't going to do it myself. I'm doing the same thing myself. I'm going to pick a person and, and that I know that's not involved, that's tangentially. You know, they come on Sunday, but they're not doing anything. Beyond. I'm picking a person that we're going to encourage. So can y'all, is that too much? I'm asking too much. Is Pastor Thomas asking too much? Let's do it. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Because by, by June or July, by June or July, and I, and I wrote this down. Let me read what I wrote What I wrote when I was sitting on the side of bed this morning. I couldn't get no sleep because I was scared I was going to go sleep and flight. I'm going to read this. And I'm going to let y'all go. Approaching God has an, uh, to have an encounter with God through prayer. Personally, nothing has been important, and I'm saying this by me, in my life is prayer. For those of us who already have a prayer life, it will strengthen your prayer life. For those who are not there yet, this class should get us there. For those who already know the Lord, we will get to know him better. This year, the men's and men, women's ministry will study the same topic, a topic that will transform our lives individually as well as our lives as a church family. As important as our Bible studies are daily, that we have that Bible study daily, twice daily, sometimes three times daily, as important as that is, uh, that we study the Bible. This subject of being uh, approaching God through prayer is equally as important. Um, okay. Wait a minute. I'm 
missed one. I, I swear, I flipped it over. Okay, here we go. For those who knew Christ, uh, newly restored our relationship, these lessons will open our, open our, okay. For those who are new to Christ or are newly restored in our relationship, and I didn't even think about, I mean, I don't even know where restored came from. The Lord just dropped in there about 1.30. Or newly restored in our relationship, these lessons will open our relationship with God to get us to know God better. This book is good because of the biblical lessons that it points to us the focus to on in, 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 in focusing on drawing closer to God. Draw nigh to God, he will draw to you. Let me read this last part. Because at this point I ran out of paper. But I was still wide awake. Let me find my notes. Almost there. This is what happens when you don't go to sleep. You can't sleep. You can't sleep. You just be jotting stuff down. Okay. Now, I was, um, <laughs> I sang this song, and hopefully the man and the woman in the room next door to me to hear this, but this is what the Lord laid on my heart. This, this is a pro I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> But I was in the, it was the middle of the night, and I was just, the Lord put this on my heart. And, and as we talked about approaching God, as we talked about approaching God, there's something about approaching God, coming close to God, having a close encounter with God, drawing near to God. Y'all heard the song. I am thine, O Lord. I've heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. The next verse says, consecrate me now to thy service by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with the steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to, the pre to thy precious bleeding side. This last part, my soul look up with the steadfast hope my will be lost in thine. So draw me nearer, nearer, precious Lord, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. When we're drawing near to God, our will gets lost in his will. When we draw near to God, our souls look up with a steadfast hope. When we draw near to God, uh, it, our arms arise in faith. That means we have more faith in God as we draw near to God. That's what I want this class to do more than anything else in the life of St. Peter Baptist Church, us individually and us as a collective body. Because as we draw near to God, we will, have, we will be accomplishing that which God wants from us. He wants us close to him. I said this before, the first five, five, five of the ten commandments about us making God number one. When we draw near to God, he becomes number one, number one, number one, number one in our lives. And when that happens, we're in a whole other plane experiencing a relationship with him. God bless y'all. Father God, we say thank you today for just a little time in your word, for your children discussing, sharing, encouraging, quite frankly, Lord, each of each other as we share not only your word, but we share the experiences and some of the things that we've done to draw close to you. And I pray for those who are here, not just us, but our families, and I pray, God, for the entirety of the St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, more than anything else, Lord. But more I pray, we pray, Lord, more than anything else, that we will become a congregation of believers who are daily seeking to draw closer to you in every one of our individual lives, that as a collective, Lord, we'll be a body of folk who are drawing closer to you, who can encourage others to come to you, who can share with those who are lost to come back to you, I pray, God, that you do that in our midst. And, God, I know as we do this, you will be glorified. We will be satisfied in our relationship with you and that those that you sent us to serve, whether they be in this neighborhood or in our neighborhoods where we live, at our jobs or in our families, Lord, they will be edified as we operate in this realm of approaching and having encounters with you. Let it be so. And let it be manifest. And let us see it, that we may be encouraged by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless y'all today.